Hello, everybody. Live on five. We'll be live at five. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to start with our special guest, um, Benny Morales. Benny comes from northern New Mexico, actually all over Albuquerque, northern New Mexico. Okay, Wingy, he's an up and coming artist in the state of New Mexico, representing the state of New Mexico and all of its people and populations. Uh, he's going to share with us some of his uh, music, it's his choice. Maybe we'll hear some originals. Maybe we'll hear, you know, some um, old time favorites. So I just want to welcome you, Benny, and welcome you to Salud y Querencia, and welcome all of our guests that are viewing from outside. Today, our theme is culture cure, so la cultura pura. And so we're going to be talking about the intersection of health and culture and how we put culture back into our systems for the, the wealth and health of our people. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll be signing off and we'll be back on at five. Um, thank you, Benny, and go ahead and take it away. Sweet. Cool. Everybody, it's good. Everyone that's on. My name is Benny Morales, and I am currently actually in Arizona right now on Zoom. Um, but I'm always representing the 505. You always got to remember where you come from, and let the world know who you are. 
So I'm just gonna be playing a couple songs and I hope you guys like them. Hopefully you guys can hear me, I actually don't know, but um, I'm just gonna keep playing some songs. So let me see what I got for you. This is actually one of my favorite songs, one of my favorite covers to play. She's a living legend, a living legend. great when you know they're gone and but it feels like they're still around and I feel like this somebody is still around um, with all the songs that she's written this was called Valerie time hope you guys like that one ah. technical difficulties oh, we got five minutes five minutes oh what i play with five minutes all right guys this last song is actually an original song <clears throat> it's not out yet i do have music out on soundcloud right now <clears throat> type in benny morales with a z at the end of it on safari and i'll you know youtube will pop up soundcloud instagram facebook so feel free to check me out um um I'm everywhere on there. And this last song is an original piece. It's actually not out yet. It's called Of The Moments. And hope you guys enjoy. Between us, don't overthink, it's only a feeling, a conversation, my little savior, if you 
no mind. Well, it's been some time, and as serious you are, I'm yours. Won't you stay a while? I could use a friend. And oh, I'd hate to be alone again. By the way. to tell someone else about the moment I missed you. For all the times it was one night only, you don't speak of, others you dream of, some you forget, and some are forgettable moments you're addicted to. Happens every time, every once in a while, I think about you. I don't want to Cause it's been some time And as serious you are I'm yours Won't you stay a while I could use a friend And oh I'd hate To be alone again And by the way I've never been Cool, guys. Well, I think that is it for me i hope you guys have an awesome day great meeting and it was uh, so great to play music for you guys thank you thank you thank you for being awesome. yes. thank you today we really appreciate it and we hope to see you live here in albuquerque in the duke city or anywhere in new mexico so definitely keep us posted on all of the different events so that we can also promote them through our networks here at the Health Equity Council. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, if you want to put, before you sign off, if you want to put your SoundCloud or any of your YouTube links in the chat, you're welcome to do that and share those as guests sign on. So we are live at five. We're right on time. Um, we'll go ahead and shift. I'd like to introduce our special guest, uh, Maritza um, Perez, will be joining us. Just give us one second while we um, change our view and start to move. There we go. Back to our gallery. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you for all those who are tuning in on Facebook and um, all of our families. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, my name is Carmela Royval. I am uh, a big supporter of the Health Equity Council here, supporting all of the different health initiatives across Bernalillo County, the city of Albuquerque, and really statewide. So this is part of our big uh, community outreach project. And so we come on here about once a month to share all of the different you know, ideas that we have around health. Uh, we bring community together. This is a space. It's a place and a safe space for everybody to come and talk about all of the different intersections of health and really talk about changing the dynamic of what we see out there, reclaiming our medicine, reclaiming our health, and reclaiming all of the different um, uh, gifts that we've been given to, to make to be healthy and you know happy communities. So I'm going to introduce my two lovely co-hosts here. Um, I have Diana Lopez to my, my left, and I have Camilla Cruz to my right, and you know, let them say a few words. Uh, and then we'll actually, I might have you, Diana, introduce our special guest. Yeah. Um, and then we will get started. So, welcome everybody. And if you wanted to introduce yourselves, then. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Thank you, Carmela. Um, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Lopez, and I am a health promotion specialist with the New Mexico Department of Health. I'm proud to be a partner here at the Health Equity Council. I work closely with staff and extended staff on many projects. Um, and I'm just really happy and excited to be here and, and to have this conversation. And 
and welcome everyone here with us. And Camilla, if you want to introduce yourself. Thank you everyone for tuning in. I'm Camilla Cruz. I'm from OKO Wing and Pueblo. Uh, this is my second time co-hosting with the Health Equity Council. I am a graduate student at the Institute of American Indian Arts. I am a poetry major. I write a lot about feminine power, maternity, um, creating conversation about the environment and regaining our power. So I'm really happy to be part of this um, conversation, help Carmela and our special guests create um, open conversations with everyone who's tuning in, and hopefully we create um, an impact for those in northern New Mexico. So thank you to so much our guests and Diana, if you'd like to, would you like to introduce maybe a few words or? Sure, and let me just pull up. I had it open, but I lost it. Um, all right, um, so Do you have it upcoming? Um, oh, here it is. Okay. All right. Yes. Yeah. No, this is, this is not yet. So, Maritza, I'm gonna. You know what? I'm gonna ask you to just talk a little bit about yourself and into you know introduce yourself. Um, we met about a month ago or a little bit longer, and we were talking about how we have these commonalities around looking at. Um, health through a cultural lens and reclaiming you know what it means to have like culture and how that's kind of been erased from the conversation and kind of erased from our communities as we move towards kind of like a western model and so coming back to that um we spoke about a month ago we had so many different ideas about it and i really if you could actually introduce yourself and then really move into kind of how you conceptualize health and culture Yes, my name is Loida Maritza Perez. I'm originally from Quisqueya, known now as the Dominican Republic in Haiti. And um, I've been in New Mexico since 2000, 2001. And um, I'm a writer and a cultural activist. And how I came to found Afromundo and think about culture and health. Um, it's something that we all know as common sense, but became very, very clear during the pandemic when so many people were in isolation, um, in need of community, in need of interactions, but not just interactions, in need of, of cultural healing because of all that was going on in the world. So, and, and just really quickly, I wanna say that I think that cultural healing is as important as social, um, racial, environmental, um, health, all of that, um, because we do not live in a vacuum and all the factors that influence our life influence our health. Can you talk to us a little bit about Afro-Mundo? Yes, um, so I mentioned this when we last met that by nature as a writer, I'm a hermit. So <laughs> it's kind of, um, well, my friends were like, Maritza, what happened to you? Because all of a sudden I became this um, more of a public person. And the reason that happened is there are certain dialogues that I wanted to hear. S certain dialogues that needed to be had culturally, um, specifically in context of the Latino community and Black Lives Matters. Um, and I'll be more specific. Um, there is a notion that Black is outside of Latinidad. And I wanted to broaden community because in the United States, 25% of Latinos identify as Afro. And beyond that, two, uh, two thirds of the slaves that were shipped to the Americas went to Spanish speaking America where slavery lasted for about 350 years. So it's not just the 
two thirds of the 12 million slaves originally, but all of their descendants during 350 years. So we're in every country in the Americas, but we're not counted, we're not um, numbered, we're thought of as outsiders. And so I wanted for cultural healing, this conversation um, for African-Americans to know that they have community beyond the United States. That what happened within the United States in terms of slavery happened throughout the Americas and that we share cultures and issues and inequities and, and together we can combat these things. Um, and not just African-American, but also indigenous peoples. I mean, sla um, slavery didn't just occur to African-Americans. It happened to indigenous people also. And from the, the, from the get go when slaves African slaves arrived to the continent, um, the solidarity between indigenous and African peoples was amazing and that those things need to be restored and ju just for a sense of health. You know, and, and the last thing I'll say before you continue asking questions and commenting is, I think that one of the people, it was an African-American elder who attended the entire series of the Afro Mundo Festival. And afterwards, because I was so busy throughout the festival, I didn't really have a chance to notice impact because I was trying to make everything work together. And one of the collaborating organizations um, and a phone call said, this was a couple of months afterwards. And she said, you know, Marita, you have no idea the impact of those programs. And she gave me this example of, of this elder who had also been one of the volunteers during the festival. And what this elder said is, I feel like I grew roots. I feel like I discovered kin throughout all of the Americas that I didn't have any awareness of. And that is really important because sometimes we feel so isolated in our battles that it leads to seclusion, it leads to, to depression. And the thing is, we're, we have to see that all of our causes are related and that is liberating. The most radical thing that we can do um, for our health is to have some measure of agency, of joy and of health. And so, that was the purpose beyond, behind Afromundo to have these conversations via the introduction, introduction of culture and arts, Afro arts and histories, and via those cultural presentations to have the public engage actively with the presenters, with the artists and with each other about history, about health, about it, it was about creating a safe space for us to engage. So I want to let some of my guests if you have any questions for. I do. Um, as a writer and as a, a fellow writer, how do you represent such a large population accurately, appropriately, uh, without misconstruing, you know, your own personal experience and projecting that on a larger population? It's such a, a thin line and it's a fine balance. How do you personally approach that? Thank you for that question because I don't, nor do I have to represent. Um, the expectation that we represent the entire culture is an expectation that others have of us. And it's a racist notion of expecting that one person from our culture speaks for all of us. That kind of question and that kind of expectation is never expected and is never asked of a an angry writer, for example. They would never say, well, so you're writing for everybody in Michigan and Detroit and the entire United States. That's only asked of us. And as a matter of fact, um, my agent might say that I, you know, shoot myself in my feet sometimes because <laughs> I, turn, I turn down the opportunity to write articles in magazines um, 
Exactly because of that, because I knew that any opinion I voiced would be interpreted as representational. And that is why I think that I was inspired to, to, to found Afromundo because there it's, it's not one voice. Like for every presentation, there are at least three or four presenters. And then on top of those presenters, the audience gets to ask questions and comment, et cetera, so that our multiple views can be conveyed so that nobody can make a generalization of who we are because we're diverse. So I say, don't let yourself be boxed into that corner of having to be representative. You represent yourself and that is enough to lend your voice to the community. Yeah, I just want to um, jump in here and ask a question to Maritza. Um, I, in my work with Department of Health, I also work a lot with um, mothers and families and parents, grandparents, uncles, aunts, anyone who's raising children. Um, and, and most recently, we had a community dialogue session where uh, family members came and we're talking about their experiences most recently, you know, with the pandemic and raising little ones around um, the ages, maybe around two to five years old. And I really resonate with the things that you've said. And it reminded me of the conversations that we had that day, talking about um, the importance of, of their culture and, and really teaching it to their little ones and, and but also allowing their little ones to, to show through with their own personal personalities and things like that. Um, I wonder if you could speak more to that specific dialogue or conversation um, when we talk to our little ones about culture and health and, and community. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up because the effects of culture are multi-generational. If parents do not have a sense of community, of belonging, of culture, we can't transmit that to our children. We can't transmit that to our grandchildren. And, and sometimes the, the best way to convey an idea is by expressing its opposite. And I'm going to do that because, um, for example, the suppression of culture was key to colonialism. Afro and indigenous traditions were banned throughout the Americas for centuries, whether it was in English speaking, Spanish speaking, French or Portuguese speaking Americas. Why? Because of the power of culture to heal, to educate, most of all, to empower. When, when you have a sense of culture and of community, you feel empowered to be, to exist. And that is why we were deprived of those things. And so it's something that we need to reclaim because our children know. You know, for example, recently uh, a friend of mine, um, she's the founder of um, Catherine Halterhiga, she's the founder of the Birthing Project, Underground Railroad for Life, invited me to, to participate in the Sacramento, Black health um, panel on maternal health of all things. And, and, and that would seem odd for a cultural person to be invited to that, but, but it's because their culture is integrally linked to the health of our children. If we don't have a sense of belonging, um, how can we pass that on to our children? And so anything that we do for ourselves as parents, as mothers, as adults is to the benefit of our children. And, and maybe the easy way to think about it is if you 
assist families financially, the adults, the parents who might be going through a hard time, that has an impact on the children directly and on future generations. And so, yeah, culture, it's, it's, it's multi-generational. The damages that can be done from the suppression of it and the empowerment that can happen in the participating in culture and community. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa, such a good. So, you know, we're looking at this structural, like I'm gonna bring structural racism into this conversation. And, and thinking through all of these different structures that were used to dismantle populations of color throughout history, right? And they're still present, right? <laughs> They're still going on. Um, we're still seeing this. We see this in the health of our children. We see this in the education. And I'm just thinking in your mind, are there, what are some of the opportunities where we can dismantle those systems of power through our culture? And I believe you do that through like the work that you do or you know, the music that we play. Even. We don't think about that as typically as a weapon of choice. And I say weapon because our music is, if, I mean, if you look through the Americas and really overcoming these different things, that's what people fought with. They fought with their voices. They fought with their words. We see that in, in South America, if we're looking at you know, a lot of the artists that were banned or exiled or murdered for singing and uplifting people. I mean, this is real talk. We don't talk about this in the United States enough about the history and how culture and art were used as frontline to defense, right? And we see that now. We saw that at DAPL. We saw all of our different communities come out and you know, we saw singing groups, we saw prayer, we saw everything, right, to preserve that. And I'm thinking, what are those opportunities that we can have within our school systems or within where we can, you know, reinvigorate, kind of bring these concepts of culture, pieces of our culture back into the places so that they can be as those mechanisms for our children to, you know, be that buffer. This is a very deep conversation, so please just your insight. Yeah, um, what I will say about that is that from the moment, from the very beginning of colo colonialism, we fought and combated. And yes, um, I, I, I like that you use the word weapon because we did combat directly by running away, et cetera, et cetera. But the most pervasive form of resistance was survival. And what I say, what I mean by that is we have to think creatively about forms of resistance because that is how we survived. Our culinary arts, I mean, food was one of the biggest mainstays of resistance um, for indigenous and Afro people. You know, when your food source is in your land, you're deprived of your land, you have to find innovative ways to survive. And for us, it was inventing dishes out of discarded food. Um, so that is creative. That is culture. Um, in Peru, for example, uh, they use the cajon, which a lot of people understand that square drum um, that is used as a drum because you know drums were banned. Most people know about the drum, but then there's another instrument was, which was a, a small box that hangs from the neck that was used by the Catholic church to, co to collect alms. And Afro slaves in Peru, what they did was they turned that into an instrument, the lid, because it was a wooden box. The lid is percussion and you hit it with a stick at the side. So the, like our survival, every bit of our culture that survives was an act of resistance. And those are the things that can really, because not everybody is equipped to march and protest and everything. But one thing that culture does is it has a power to give us strength and engage us civically so that we feel entitled to participate, to vote, to, to make changes. Um, and, and just speaking directly about Afro Mundo, that, that was the 
important thing for me to, and for the collective, because we're a collective, a community organization that to bring culture as a way of bringing community in and, the, and those arts and traditions to serve as an introduction to dialogue. And it was important because yes, these dialogues are had in academic um, settings and in conferences, et cetera. Um, I wanted, and we all wanted this conversation to be had within community. Um, uh, people, parents who may not have the time to go to UNM for a lecture, et cetera, for it to be for the population at large. Um, and what, what's a little difficult about what we do is that we insist on the programs being free. No matter how world renowned the artist who is presenting is for, th for the presentation to be provided to the public for free, because what is the use of having these dialogues if those dialogues depend on somebody's income? I love that. Is there anyone in our audience that want, has any questions or wants to share or join the conversation? You're welcome to unmute. You can uh, uh, open your screen up and you're welcome to, you know, join us in this. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot here, right? We don't see this. We don't see this typically talked about or we see bits and pieces kind of integrated, but we don't see like the whole picture. So I want to go back and this is probably one of my favorite topics because you know culture is medicine music is medicine and I want to talk about how medicine and how this kind of this piece has been um, removed from you know the medical system or it's been removed it's not part of right uh, we do see models where it's integrated like if you go to Mexico City you can see some of the integration um, in some of the main hospitals you'll see that in different parts of the world um, but that's not something that we have here right it's not considered the scientific, even though we actually have data and proof like the impacts and effects that music has on health or on, on curing and different things like that. But these are knowledges that have gone back thousands of years, right? That have been um, given. You mentioned something about the drum. And I find this so interesting because I was just watching a documentary and we were talk it was talking about um, Carnaval and how drums were, were banned and prohibited. And so, and, and we see this across the globe. We see this here in the United States. We see this in New Mexico. You know, we saw, we saw um, the forced removal of our tribal singers, leaders, healers. We saw the, actually the massacre. You know, we have photographs of all of our um, tribal singer, you know, you know we, we see these really gruesome we saw that stripped, we, you know, we still have that, but so many communities here in New Mexico, across the globe, Latino America have overcome and just reinvented this idea of the drum. But isn't it a fact when you come from a community where that drum is kind of the heartbeat that it translates across, right? You can go, I can go to South America and hear that drum and know exactly how how we're feeling at that moment, right? And we join that way. But I just kind of wanted to open a conversation about this. Can you imagine the drum is like one of the most critical healing pieces of culture across the Americas um, and how it's just, I don't know if you have any stories or any insight, uh, you know, even other examples and parts of the Americas where, you know, I, I see all these metal barrels, right? Turned into drums or even the kettle drum with water. And you see, like you see all these different variations to to recreate that heartbeat. Um, but I know that that's really, you know, something, and I think as indigenous people and, and like Afro-Latino, Latino, Afro, Latino, Afro we, you know, this is something that we have in common, right? That's really a core aspect of culture, of yeah. medicine and of health. So, you know, your, your comments, inside examples, I just, I love this um, discussion. Yes, I love that you said heartbeat because that is what it is. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the very heartbeat of the earth. I mean, literally when we hear drums, okay, let me speak personally for myself. <laughs> when, when I hear- oh, We're with you on that one. We're definitely <laughs> with you on that one. You ain't the only one. You know, when I hear drums, I don't care from which culture, 
lo voy a decir en español, just to be funny, me monto. What, and what that means is like, I get mounted. And, and that's like a term of voodoo, of being um, inhabited by the spirit. Because something about the heartbeat that courses through our body as we hear the drums connects us to the earth. But it doesn't just connect us to the earth, it connects us to spirit, to ancestors, to, to each other, it to, there's just something so powerful about it and so grounding about it that, yeah, it's terrifying for those who do not have drum practices. And I think that that's why its power was banned, but um, it, it's, it's also such a unifying force. And as you said, whether it, regardless of what culture we come from, those of us who are descended from the drum, I like to say, we recognize that unifying spirit wherever we hear percussion. And if drums don't exist and, and are banned, not only did we make them from, you know, cans or boxes or whatever, if all of those were deprived, if we were deprived of all of those, we used our feet to drum on the earth and create that feeling because we were not going to have our heartbeat taken away from us. And, and that's why I say that some of the most per, pervasive forms of resistance were subversive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanna to add to that. Um, it really resonates with me, that music conversation because uh, in, in Taos, Northern New Mexico, I come from a family of musicians. And it goes way back to my great great grandfather who would play the violin or or you know um, play the drums or the trumpet or the saxophone and like he literally played all these instruments and it's come it's came down through the generations. And every time I hear it, I it's like I get transformed and transported or transformed into that time to that and I to feel that and it mm -hmm creates a connection and um, I also was thinking about some conversations that I've been in recently and and it's again related to some other community programming around juvenile uh, justice mm -hmm. for our, again our youth I want to bring that up you know talking about um, art programming specific music and just how empowered I mean just that feeling I don't even know if I have the words to describe the feeling that you get when you hear the music of our familia of our of our childhood and it's just to to carry that with us I think is so important and not to be afraid to sing and to get up and dance and because I do know yeah. um I have experienced in the past, like my grandmother, to where she sometimes would not want to get up and dance because she would feel like, oh, you know, we can't, there's other people who may not understand or things like that. But now I did, I have noticed that she's reached her early 90s where she's just, do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hold that deer, hold that pole. So I just really love this conversation about music and how you say, um, what was the Spanish word that you what they mentioned that you like, well, mounted? Yes, and it's a term of being literally mounted by yes, deity. That, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. That's beautiful. I kind of want to go off that too. You're mentioning you know, our grandparents, I have the same experience as my grandparents were musically inclined, but we're reaching this point where not all of us, your children are musically inclined, but there's a large portion of the population where it's not being carried on, mm -hmm. where for instance, I, I didn't get taught that because my grandparents were passed. And there was that point, right? Especially in indigenous communities where our language was suppressed during boarding school time, our traditions were suppressed, 
that musical pass on was also suppressed. Right. And our next generations are unfortunately not being encouraged. And you had mentioned that, that encouragement through art programs or music programs mm -hmm. and getting that really fuel, um, whether we start that, you know, in one community, in one county, in one state, but how is it that we can be proactive? How can we encourage the people in power now to see how important that music is so that my children can carry that on and then the next generation can have that again that way it doesn't stop with our grandparents mm -hmm. right because i feel like we're we're all yearning for that and it's absolutely a, a generational pass on but it's not moving as and well we as see these be. programs cut in the education system mm -hmm. music dance the funding and we don't right so that might be something that we want to talk to legislative bodies you know, we need to reinstate music that saves lives, that saves children's lives. Yes. You know, and really, this is the impact that's so occurring, right? So that might be a great point of intervention or a policy or something to start supporting, but also making that connection of the importance, because I think that's not made clear. So it was a clear cut to remove them and reduce funding and reduce, but it wasn't, you know, that connection wasn't brought to the forefront of, no, this is actually life-saving. How many people have you heard in your life that music saved my life? Or, you yeah, know, you, yeah. you see this in like popular, but it really, you know, it goes all the way um, back historically, right? The, like the power of that or being, or hearing or being part of it, or, right. you know, mm -hmm. restoring language through music or communication and things like that. Um, in my experience working in early childhood, I had several students who, you know, weren't able to speak, but when we played music, mm -hmm. right. they were dancing, mm -hmm. you know, they heard. So we, we have a lot of, you know, like our younger children that have gone through a lot of traumatic and that was the one way that we could reach them mm -hmm. and like just bring that out. So I think really connecting and making that, that part heard that music as culture, art, pottery, like whatever these, you know, drum making, clothes making, you know, cooking, mm -hmm. that's an art, right? This is all part of cultural healing and cultural spaces that need yes, to be recreated. Definitely. And I just want to note on Facebook, um, on our live Facebook, we had a comment from Matt Cross that said drums are important in celebrations in Panama. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It, um, and they're used to usher us into different aspects of our lives. That's why they're so important. But about, I, I, um, I want to go back to what all of you were discussing about the need for arts and music in schools. Um, they're essential in all aspects of our communities. You, you know, um, they're essential. They should be in juvenile detention centers. They should be in schools and community centers. And these arts and these music presentations should be community driven and equitable. But we know that the society in which we live isn't equitable. And so as, okay, as we work towards equity and inclusion, um, we also have to consider alternate spaces and alternate platforms because we might be forever waiting. We hope not, we're all working towards equity and inclusion, but in the meantime, our communities suffer. Um, and so sometimes it takes us as a community creating these platforms for ourselves and for each other. And that is why um, Afromundo came to be because look, I, I like I said, I always resisted being a public person. Yes, I could do a reading and then leave and whatever, you know, and, and put it on public face during a reading. But beyond that, like I said, I didn't want to write articles. I didn't want to be representative because I didn't want to be pigeonholed. And what made me step out from behind my desk was you know, I had been wanting these conversations to be had for a really long time. And I kept waiting for these conversations to be had within community at a large scale. And when, when it wasn't happening, I thought, okay, enough Maritza, who are you gonna blame? You know, step out from behind this desk and, 
and find some way to do it. Um, sure, funding is scarce, whatever, but you know what's amazing? Community is not scarce. Right. And, and, and community makes things happen. We have to remember that, you know, and I like to say that Afromundo was based on the concept of convite and it's this tr tradition and in the Dominican Republic and, and a lot of uh, countries and throughout the Americas where a community in an isolated town or in a pueblo, whatever, they depend on each other and they form convites. It's like a collective to build somebody's house, um, to bury someone, to take care of the sick. It's a recognition that everybody in a community has a talent, has an ability, has something to share, can volunteer, and that we as a community have the power to address those things as we work towards equity in a larger scale. And I think that model is something that we need to adapt and that, that we really uphold in here at Salud y Querencia. I, when I introduced the show, I didn't even say the name of the show, but this is Salud y Querencia. <laughs> this is Health y Querencia, our place of belonging, our stronghold, you know, and, and so culture is our stronghold. This is our place of belonging. And, and so, um, and also I needed to recognize our funders. So we're supported through Kellogg and the CDC. This is through, um, there's a whole bunch of different, the Health Council, um, the Alliance of Health Councils, uh, the Department of Health. And so we have a lot of different supporters of this space right here. Um, and I wanted to give recognition also to my co-producer, Anna Horner, who is not on camera, but is definitely behind the scenes, um, really supporting and creating these spaces and making this happen today. So I wanted to give Anna a special shout out. Um, so we're, we're so grateful because these conversations need to be had. We cannot talk about equity and inclusion if we don't recognize what's important to people of color. It's not, equity and inclusion is not about putting brown bodies, red bodies in these positions. It's about recognizing truly what is important to these people, yeah. to us. And so we cannot say we are promoting equity unless we are providing the spaces that we truly need. That's sovereignty allowing the people to actually define what it is for us to have you know what's important what's in our heart what is that we need what kind of foods do we need to eat what kind of you know what kind of day-to-day -day routine do we need to have supported and and so i think with this idea of a concept of our cultures and our sovereign cultures to be integrated are so central if we're going to even move that dial and that's frightening because that's putting back everything that was stripped and taken away through all of these projects. I wanna talk a little bit about racial projects. So we talk, this is kind of like my, my uh, sociology academic side, right? We talk about racist racial projects, all of these different projects that go on through history that really shape and define race and who our people are, right? They re-identify and there's these like mini projects. They could be policies, it could be an institution, but they constantly are moving around and they're constantly acting as these kind of bodies that define who we are or try to, right? And we put up resistance to these kind of, you know, little, um, I say little projects, but these are major projects. They shape our identity. They tell us who and where, who we are, where we're allowed, what spaces are safe spaces for people of color, which are not, you know, things like that. And so thinking through that, you know, this is a very, I also think that culture can be its project in itself as an anti-racist project, an anti-racist racial project, mm -hmm. where we can, this idea that we've always, you know, we kind of keep our head down and survive, you know, it's not enough. We resist it in so many beautiful ways. So it's one thing to talk about health disparities, but it's another thing to talk about the power of resistance. And I think this is the conversation and this is the location that we need to have and really think of this. If we're gonna think equity inclusion, how do we build this culture piece into that anti-racist project to go again, you know, to, to start to really um, rebuild and create that space and help. Like, how are we gonna move this health dial if we're not doing what's good for our, you know, for our villages? We don't have our language or we're not allowed to speak in, you know, what, what's the population? This used to be a dual language state. Everyone here spoke eight plus languages to Spanish, English. We even have French, Northern New Mexico, right? Spanish, English, French. 
And then we have all of our traditional native languages, some of our families, but we don't have that anymore, right? We have to resist and really create these different spaces and projects if we want to be truly equitable. I don't know what your your comments or or, or, or thoughts on that, but you know. It's interesting you use the word resistance. Before I go on, I want to say, I think I saw somebody's hand up, oh, okay. Chris yeah. Hollis, but about resistance, it's interesting because the 2023 um, Afro Mundo Festival is actually centered around resistance. Okay, and well, we're going to support you in any way that we can. We need to put a plug in. Yeah, you know, we need to, we need to yeah it's called it. resistance and creativity, but we'll talk yeah. about it a little bit. Resistance and creativity. Yeah. Yeah. But I think um, some, yeah, uh, Chris Hollis had a question. I saw a hand raised. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't raising my hand. I was using the little applauding sign for Anna. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. No, I mean, you're, you're, you stimulating, you're stimulating a lot of thoughts in my <laughs> head, um, but you know, nothing that comes out without being a total jumbled mess at this point. So. <laughs> <laughs> No, but um, that for resistance, we have to think of there are multiple ways in which to resist and be proactive. And it's important to say that because sometimes, uh, look, like I remember when I was back in college, yeah, this was back in the 80s at Cornell, whatever, and there were, going, there were so many um, um, anti-apartheid protests back in the 80s and I remember and it wasn't one it was multiple white friends of mine saying well Marita why aren't you there at the protest and 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 my answer would always be first of all there are lots of different ways to resist they don't always have to be public but something that you are not even taking into consideration and asking me that question is that an arrest record for me is different than an arrest record for you. Yes. Because sometimes we think that, you know, there's only one, that power lies in one method of being. And as I said, um, during slavery, most people did not have the luxury or the opportunity right. to run away. I mean, so much of the resistance Look, going back to food, because, you know, resistance through food wasn't always pretty. It was also self-starvation to be able to commit suicide and choose the moment of death and not eat. And that is why that um, they invented those things. You know, these were homemade contraptions to force feed slaves so that even the choice of death wasn't theirs, meaning there are so many different ways to... Um, to resist and and that the most powerful is to to live yes to you know to live with to find some measure of joy and dignity and culture to, and community to find community when when we're meant to be you know broken apart individually and communally it's an amazing feat and it's so empowering. And through community and culture as an introduction to civic engagement, seriously, I think that anything is the limit. That we can be capable of so much more than we even know that we are capable of. Thank you, Marita. You are. Is there anyone in our audience that has any questions? I just, I love this conversation. I can't wait to support uh, from the 2023. Um, I, I, yeah, I can't wait to help council the Budget Policy Institute, like any way that we can support your efforts and, and be a community, right? And then we have those, those understandings. And so I think just through connection, community, and building that network, fortifying that network, um, I just feel like, you know, we're gonna learn so much. So as much as we get, we, we take that with us as well. So we're all about supporting you and all those efforts. I mean, this is, this, this is culture, this is equity, this is bringing it to the table. So, you know, I just, 
I can't even reiterate that because we see these buzzwords, of, you know, equity this and equity. And I'm like, where is the equity when there is no voice? If you can't be for us without us, you can't build equity without us, you know, and having that. And so we really need that, um, you know, that integral piece and, and you know, culture as our, as our shield, you know, as our, our way of, you know, this, this is what we've used so for thousands of years, you know, to buffer and buffer these effects. But it's time to thrive, right? It's time to flourish. Um, surviving, you know, surviving is, is, is a hard mode, you know, it's a hard space to stay in. And that's so many of our communities in survival day-to-day -day mode. And, you know, how do we move from this survival to thriving, you know? And this is our mecca, this is our vehicle. Um, yeah, is there any questions in the audience? Um, I don't have any more, but again, yeah, I just wanna um, open it up to anyone here on our Zoom. Um, if, you, if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or you can raise your hand. Whatever you like. Um, I'm just going to check in with Anna to see if we have any questions on Facebook. No. And it's a, there's a lot being said here. I mean, That's we have, right. you know, this is something that needs to continue and to be unpacked. And, and you know, really, we need to really dive in there and, and acknowledge that all of these practices are culture and are medicine, right? Whether it's birthing practices or language practices, whether it's music or art or dance or, you know, any anything, but we need to recognize that those are really integral pieces to our healing, to our process, and to really changing empowerment, number one, really empowering. You know how beautiful it is to be able to speak your language and to be in public and not be ashamed. Learning our, our you know, traditional recipe, recipes, recipes, things like that. Yeah. And maintaining right those lessons and those knowledges that are passed on, and then just sharing. I had this conversation the other day. We were talking about a lot of the the borders. We just didn't have a border. We were able to trade back and forth. So we we had this the Americas, right? We didn't have the the U.S. Mexico border or the Canadian. We had Mother Earth. That we were able to travel and traverse across all of these lands. We used to travel. You know, there's lots of stories with all of the tribes trading, you know, in the Dominican Republic and the Caribe and everywhere you could have thought of and, and back and forth. And so you see like in here in New Mexico, you see a lot of the pieces, you know, the macaw feathers that come from the Southern regions. We don't have macaw growing in, right? So all of these integral pieces and parts of our culture, the shells and the different things that we, those, you know, we didn't have borders. So we need to really think about kind of removing though, that type of aspect and how critical you know, kind of to stop separating ourselves so much from all of our different, you know, relatives, because I think that's created such a division mentally for so many people that it's hard to understand that these are our relatives, right? We were free to trade and that's how we became who we became and the power that we have. And so I, I always think, you know, having these conversations and thinking about all of the different cultural knowledges that we've gained from crossing borders and from, you know, and not borders, we're just taking a stroll across the land. <laughs> you know, these borders came so much later. You know, this was part of our community. Puerto Rico, like all of this, this is our family. What happens to them happens to us here. So that, you know, restoring that critical connection so that we're, we grow with a healthy community, healthy people, human, right? Being human, the most essential little piece that we just, you know, we just don't, we think health is just not going to the doctor or you know medical system, but it's not. It's having those those healthy relations, those relationships with all of our relations globally. I like what you said about trade. As weird as Zoom has been and has become with COVID, <laughs> this is our new form of trade, right? Yes. I'm learning your yes. culture because I'm able to see you on Zoom. I'm able to share this space with you, and this is our new form of cross-border communication. And we really need to take this tool that we've all been so stuck in, we're stuck in these little squares, but we can use that to our advantage now. We can share our stories and we can go back to that trade across borders. And I think it's time, like you said, we stop surviving, we use these tools and now it's time to be empowered and take it back. We're not going anywhere. So yeah, we're not going anywhere. We ain't going anywhere. <laughs>
you know, we're all, we have we have new shoals and we have you know it's really moving that battle and it's mm-hmm. right. I love that. You're right. This is our new form of trade. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, and and we have to. We have to. We it was there once. It's never gone away. It's just bringing it back up to the and putting it on the right, you know, in its rightful place, you know, in our hearts and our minds. That's the rightful place where where all of these knowledges need to exist. And so it's just it's just an honor and it's a privilege to sit here and talk about health and art and culture and our people and and, and have this platform, which was just a little vision the other day. So we really just started creating this so that we have that space um, without any you know interruption. Like what's on our heart, what's on our mind. And so I just I thank you so much. You know, we're not we 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 still have a little bit of time, but I I you know I just can't thank you enough for no um and that's as you were speaking, that is what I was thinking. I was just swelling with gratitude because thank you for concocting this platform. Um my soul feels full. And I haven't eaten lunch. I'm going to eat as <laughs> <laughs> But I feel full because just, I think that something is happening collectively in different communities throughout the country and the world because that you came up with this platform that I thought of Afromundo. I've just been noticing the the collective need like these um, platforms are cropping up independently but it's a sign of the desperate need that exists for such platforms and just I feel like I met family by engaging in this dialogue Um, and that's why at the very beginning before the meeting started I said you know I don't think that you know you guys are going to disappear from my life. For example, <laughs> well, we're there's... playing the Stockholm, the Afromundo life. <laughs> we're going to be there, right? Like, you know? Yes, yeah. because yeah. it's so beautiful, and the dialogue is so essential. And and I've been hungry for this. I want. I I want to say really quickly. Um, like re, um, recently, I I found out um that I was um. Uh, national leaders of color it's for arts presenters one from every state so there's like um 50 and then also from guam virgin island puerto rico but it's indigenous black afro latino asian um artists and arts presenters being able to have a dialogue and it doesn't involve money or anything but it's an eight month dialogue that I was so thrilled to 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 find out I could be a part of because we need these spaces to to share ideas and to voice concerns and voice solutions also and to voice frustrations etc it's just community is essential and platforms like this provided and just thank you I, I I'm filled with gratitude for being invited to this I know I feel so honored to have you, you know, just given your, just all the work that you've done. And I mean, it's just amazing. And, you know, for coming out and just sharing time and space and really, because this isn't just, you know, it's like exactly, this isn't just, this isn't an idea, just our idea or it just surfaced, right? This is a need. This is something we need all hands on deck. And we need that solidarity. We need everybody to participate and really, and just you know, have a sense of belonging and connectedness, right? And removing the different types of you know divisions and, and pieces. And there's so many parts, and this could definitely, you know, I, I definitely want to do another segment on culture and health because it is so critical. I know um, now in November we're going to have our talks on healthy masculinity, fatherhood. And, you know, what does that look like? And, you know, we'll have people here to really talk about that and mentoring, you know, mentoring our young men. Like, what does that look like? How do we rebuild, right? Create that balance again. And then in December, we're going to talk about, you know, traditional medicine specifically. 
and the integrate of traditional medicine. So, so modern medicine, you know, it's just a couple hundred, you know, it's just a couple years back. <laughs> it's just a couple years back. And and traditional medicine, we say traditional because we when when we talk about it in English in like the Western sense, we give it that like it's old fashioned and outdated um, type thing, right? That's kind of how. And so I, I kind of want to just you know reiterate that this medicine and this culture, thousands of years since creation, that was given to us the power to heal and to have everything that we needed on this earth to thrive. And we have thrived for thousands of years. You know, we, and then we, you know, we see this through all these colonizations and all these different pieces and the reduction of population and those knowledges. But yeah, it's time to really move it out of that, that space that it's, you know, obsolete or not as powerful as West or, you know, things like that and move it, you know, back into the front and center. That's equity. You know, knowing that, that that's equity. So I just, I am just so grateful to have this um, conversation and have you, you know, as family, as family to continue this dialogue. And you know, in New Mexico, once you're family, you're family for life. <laughs> <laughs> you're stuck yes. with us. You're stuck oh, with us. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're stuck with us. So we hope yeah. to see you in Ore Winge uh, yeah. for feast or maybe hopefully in December we'll be open, but definitely for you know, our feast days in the springtime. You know, I am there. Yeah, you have family a, to get together. Get the drum, just yes. come on down. Yeah. But, you know, these, you know, we're here, we're thriving, we're working together, all hands on deck. So important that we're all in our spaces working as hard as we can to uplift those voices. So I just want to thank everyone today. I want to thank you, Maritza, for sharing your time. I want to give special thanks to Benny Morales, our artist who came on found his voice through music and the guitar and and we hope that we continue these conversations i don't hope we will continue these we just our platform is going to get bigger and because that's definitely how we're going to do that right and so i just you know blessings to everybody that joined us and i don't know if you have any closing words or anything you want to share yeah, i just want to say thank you maritza thank you for sharing all of everything you said just really really filled my soul as well and, and my heart and um just I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful for this conversation. I'm grateful for for this empathic you know community building space. Um, so I just want to thank you and, and I look forward to seeing you again <laughs> because we are connected. <laughs> And maybe in person one day outdoors or yes. something. <laughs> yes, yes. Quickly, I want to say that I'm really looking forward to reading your book. So you have Geographies of Home. Um, mm -hmm. That's a problem that I'm definitely going to take a look at. You have an upcoming book also, Beyond the Pale. Uh, when is that forthcoming? Afromundo has distracted me a little from that. <laughs> <laughs> So all I can say is in the works and I am hungry to get back to the writing because it's as important as this work. But right now, um, my focus has to be community mm -hmm. and I'll return to that private endeavor and sneak it in yes. Starting yes. next year, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone Thank you. for joining us in Facebook audience. And we hope to see you next month. Thank you and stay tuned for our next event. So, Noah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.